Faculty at the University of Nottingham and the co-founder of the Campaign for Public Universities. So I'll turn over to John. Okay, thank you. And uh, the context of what I'm <coughs> going to speak about is the current Higher Education and Research Bill, how to understand this and what its implications are. This is currently going through uh, Parliament at the moment, and in fact, Monday is the third reading in the House of Commons. So what I'm going to suggest is that what this bill represents is the last and most radical stage of a process which began with the Jarrett Report. So some of the things I'm going to talk about have been features of universities for a while, but they're now being accentuated and developed much more strongly than in the past, deriving from the Brown Review in 2010 and the white papers that followed that. It's uh, possibly worth saying the Brown Review, of course, Lord Brown was CEO of BP, uh, was president of the Royal Society of Engineers, leading advocate of the impact agenda, currently CEO of Quadrilla. Another member of the Brown Review was the Vice Chancellor, David Eastwood, of Birmingham <coughs> University, which is now revealed as a university which has moved fastest towards the casualization of, of staff. So obviously, uh, David Eastwood knows what the new arrangements are bringing into being because he's part of involved in um, uh, developing and um, uh, projecting. Essentially, it's about the extension of the markets through the facilitation of for-profit higher education. So that's what the current bill is about. I'm producing consumer information to students through the uh, teaching excellence framework. That is. In, uh, how uh, students are going to evaluate a course provision in order to enable them to make judgments about which university uh, to go to. So that's the broad aspect of what the current legislation is doing. But it also gives increased powers to university management. That involves the reinforcement of managerial hierarchy which has developed since um, the Jarrett Report and to government ministers. It's absolutely important to recognize that what the new uh, UKRI, which is one of the bodies that is being set up within this uh, legislation, will do is remove the royal charters that governed older universities and also the royal charters governing research councils such that the Minister for State now has direct powers in relation to uh, universities and in um, you know, the committees that are set up through the Office of the Students or through the uh, UKRI research uh, body, the minister can place uh, representatives directly on any of their committees and indeed reserves the right to sit on uh, committees him or herself. And the nature of that direct government intervention, you already see in after Brexit the way in which this proposal to link a recruitment of overseas students to the status of institutions and their quality of their courses. So almost immediately the, the TEF as a means to provide students with information is being put forward as a means to manage uh, immigration. So how should we understand what is happening? And in a sense, it's useful to understand it in contrast to the past. I'm just going to briefly put this slide up to uh, uh, represent what public higher education was and what in the 1960s Robbins inaugurated for a system of higher education and its particular functions that higher education should meet. And the important aspect of it, I think, from the point of view of the current legislation, apart from the fact of the ideas of presenting higher education as a social right is the way in which it uh, uh, has a research function as absolutely central within universities and the way in which it links the research function to the, to the teaching function. Mm -hmm. And really what people talked about at this uh, time, forgive me I'm a sociologist so this doesn't look like jargon to me but it might sort of feel like that to the rest of you, is people talked about a knowledge society. And in articulating the idea of a knowledge society, what Robbins and the legislation around it did was set out that there was an inclusive public interest in higher education, and in particular, <coughs> education should be understood as a social right 
and that it underpins democratic inclusion. So the fact that uniquely within British education, universities were going to be public institutions rather than part private, part public, was argued that uh, these reforms would start to mitigate and ameliorate old status hierarchies which uh, occurred in, in Britain. And of course, higher education was also associated with economic growth, but that economic growth was perceived as, as inclusive as well. After Piketty, we're used to the idea that uh, inequality has risen again from the 1970s, but at the time when uh, um, Robbins was writing, the expectation was that inequality would decline and that the knowledge society would involve benefits to all because economic growth would be uh, inclusive. And there's also an emphasis about knowledge being necessary to facilitate democratic citizenship. In the context of Brexit, Trump, and the idea of post-truth, the idea that universities should be a space to facilitate debates which had public significance is, of course, you know, a very crucial uh, issue. And we could say, well, and of course, uh, this was the era of the large research university. We also know that uh, large research uh, universities were attached to big science, and big science itself had you know, some of the problems that we've been hearing about uh, uh, this morning. But what I'll say is that what was different there was if you said that what was happening was that universities were becoming like large corporations, the argument of the knowledge society was also that large corporations were becoming like universities. That is, that large corporations were moving away from a focus on uh, short-term profits, were able to address long-term uh, interests, and that the role of managers within corporations was to mediate between competing interests, where the interest of shareholders was only one of those interests. And it's that idea of corporate governance that is being changed right across institutions, but also being changed within universities. So corporations are no longer becoming like universities. They're reverting to a older model of corporate uh, governance, one based on shareholder value. And universities, when they become like corporations, are becoming like neoliberal corporations. Just to show you, that's Piketty's slides about the top 10% distribution of earnings and just showing you across a number of countries declining inequality until round about the 1980s then a serious <coughs> upturn of inequality. So the policies that I'm talking about changing universities are changing universities to fit with inequality that is no longer inclusive, that is inequality that leaves some behind. So what is uh, neoliberalism associated with, uh, and it's associated with a global knowledge economy, and that's one of the reasons why uh, universities are being changed to fit <coughs> the public policies that are uh, you know, connected uh, to uh, wider economic policies. I think a lot of people, and you know, perhaps it's peculiar to the um, discipline I come from, but within sociology, had a general idea that what university, you know, function of universities was critical and partly to ameliorate inequality. Now, universities are argued to be the engine of economic development, and economic development which is itself <coughs> the development of inequality. So there's no way that universities can be said to be outside that process. They are, in a sense, one of the major agents of the production and reproduction of inequality. And how that production and reproduction of inequality takes place is through shifting corporate governance towards short-term uh, shareholder value and also through the capture of economic policy by national elites who in a sense function offshore. And that's part of the way in which uh, corporations avoid taxation, uh, uh, and not only corporations, but uh, 
their senior uh, executives as well. Within that context, one gets the deregulation of labor markets and financial markets, associated with the pol polarization of jobs, precarious employment, and poverty <coughs> in employment. That is, in the Robbins period, <coughs> poverty was associated with not having a job. Now, poverty is associated with having uh, a job. And of course, those features of employment are now within the university itself. The university is a microcosm of that, and that's what the Guardian article was in effect uh, uh, setting out. Not simply the casualization of uh, academic research and teaching jobs, but also the outsourcing of security, catering, cleaning, and so on. So whenever a university says we're a living wage employer, you have to ask, and which of your um, people working on campus are employed by outsourced co companies, and what are the wages of the outsourced uh, company. But it's also associated, as we know, with financial irresponsibility, pursuit of profits from rent-seeking rent behavior. The finance sector earns 1.7 times other sectors, and the last time that uh, disparity occurred was in the 1930s. And, the, and in a sense, what is happening within the legislation for universities is precisely financialization, turning uh, uh, funding of uh, universities on the basis of direct allocation from government to be it being done through student fees, then processes of privatization of the student loan book, which is all part of what is happening. The demonstration in London today about the teaching uh, excellence framework is about the association of the TEF to raising fees at the same and saying, well, actually the TEF is to ensure good quality education for students. It will be the means of universities increasing fees. And at the same time, by the way, we've just frozen our commitment to increase um, the repayment threshold in line with inflation. So the repayment threshold has been frozen, and of course inflation is likely to go up after Brexit. So again, students are being squeezed. And, you know, financialization you can take through a whole series of it. If you look at university investment in student housing, and <coughs> notice the crisis around the rented sector, which is a sector <coughs> which has seen biggest rise in rents by about 25% over the last few years, it's rents of student accommodation. So there's a whole process uh, going on uh, in that way. And of course, part of what I said I would show here is that one of the consequences of a short-term emphasis upon um, uh, shareholder value is a crisis in research and development within the private sector. And so what you show is from the 1980s, and if you go back further, Britain had relatively high proportion of its uh, GDP in, in uh, research and development. And as other countries have increased, Britain has got less. So we've moved from being one of the highest investors in uh, research and development to being one of the lowest within uh, OECD countries. And given the arguments, general arguments about marketization and how markets should operate, actually the Department uh, for Business, Innovation and Science has very few levers on the economy except through universities. And that's partly the way in which universities are now being pressed in a commercialized direction in order to fix the R&D problem, which derives itself from the nature of economic policies which encourage short-term uh, value. So what is it we now know universities to be? And what will they be firmly uh, established as being from the uh, next uh, week? <coughs> Education is now an investment in human capital and a private responsibility of individuals. That's students as consumers. There's an entry of for-profit providers, 
So the idea is in order to make a market for higher education work, you're going to change the nature and definition of the university itself to allow for-profit providers in. That's especially multinational corporations, Apollo Group, Pearson, and so on. And that's what the removal of the direct funding of teaching was about, to enable them to come in and also to give them access to, stu to fee uh, students carrying loans. But it also means freeing universities to pursue for-profit activities and to seek for-profit par partners and indeed to change their corporate form. So the legislation, the removal of the Royal Charter is not some arcane thing, it's something that now enables university councils and senates to change the nature of the organization itself without having to seek uh, uh, approval through a parliamentary uh, process. That includes the possibility of managerial buyouts, uh, entry of venture capital. Open University has a for-profit arm its for-profit arm is designed to attract uh, venture capital uh, investment, and its for-profit arm is designed to provide online distance learning. What's the Open University doing otherwise? So the university is setting up, the Open University is setting up a university in competition with itself, and will gradually pull the Open University into the for-profit. Uh, version. There's going to be an unbundling of activities and an outsourcing of functions within universities. Given that for-profit uh, universities don't have a research function, they put the research function of other universities under pressure. And that is something being actively lobbied for by the Russell Group, who sees that in this context, the limited, or what they perceive as limited available research funds would be better concentrated upon the Russell Group itself, and that other universities should shift for themselves as teaching-only institutions. London Met has already gone down this process and is currently changing its contracts and so on, explicitly to compete with uh, for-profit universities. Who's the new chair of the uh, uh, council that uh, London met? Oh, it happens to be somebody from Pearson. So there's a whole series of agendas called modernization and efficiency, which have been going on under the radar at Universities UK, and are all projects about outsourcing, sharing, casualization, and so on. They're all done in the name of efficiency and also value for money. But the value for money is having leveraged students for fees. We now demonstrate to students that what we're doing with that leveraged money is giving them value for you know, is giving them value for you know, their investment uh, now because universities were after the austerity budget of 2010 were the only sector that didn't experience a cut in income and revenues, but actually got an increase as a consequence of shifting from direct funding to student fees. And the final thing is the impact agenda. Um, already the Rothschild report as a customer <coughs> contractor report and the customer should pay has been mentioned. But there's some peculiar inversion of the, Roth of the uh, Rothschild principle has taken place. And that is, although students are identified as private beneficiaries of their education and they should pay, now the impact agenda is that you should find somebody who has a use for your research and you will be only be funded for your research insofar as you could find a user and the user should not pay. Profitable user. Sorry? Profit making user. Well, in the social sciences it varies between the two, but yes, commercial and profit user as well. Because they say, well, the best way of thinking of the impact of danger is to shorten the time from idea to income. That's design. That's already introducing into universities the short term <coughs> orientation, which 
has undermined research and development in the private sector and is now uh, set to do it in the university. But as I think, because I also said there was something going on which is about the idea of uh, democracy itself. Because one way is we could say, well, what is the purpose of research? <coughs> and uh, there being multiple purposes, I am not hostile to the idea of research being commercially useful, but that's not the only function of a university. A university has multiple functions, and the one that's most crucial at this sort of present moment in time is its function to facilitate debate. And I think, and, you know, as a you know, philosophically inclined sociologist, my way of thinking about what's going on is that this is not a conflict between the state and the market, but a conflict between the market and the public. The American philosopher John Dewey said that what, democrat what democracy depended upon was the nature of publics who were informed and organized through dialogue. And what politics was about was the representation of publics through uh, knowledgeable discourse and dialogue. On that definition, the market is non-dialogical. Nobody enters into a dialogue in order to make a purchase. And so if you say, well, what is the significance of privatizing universities and marketizing universities? It's precisely to undermine their status as public institutions. They're institutions within a public space of the production and dissemination of knowledge which includes both the production of expertise, but also mechanisms for the evaluation of expertise. We're being asked within universities to have a direct co-production relationship with one user. And in effect, what that's asking us to do is short circuit the wider public to, in a sense, make our uh, knowledge available to specific users rather than make it available in a public sphere for general discussion. So I think that the privatization of the public university should be understood as profoundly uh, anti-democratic. And we have professional commitments to knowledge, but I don't think we can now separate <coughs> the functions of knowledge from the issue of democracy. And we're called to respond as scientists to how the knowledge, the circumstances of knowledge production has changed, but also we're required as citizens to respond to the debasement of public debate by the undermining <coughs> public institutions like the university.